So what would be the right balance of skill and infrastructure uh, that is needed for a country to develop and for CPAC to be a success? CPAC will be a success if we speed up fast track the process. If we streamline our procedures, our processes and our procedures are still uh, quite cumbersome for a foreign investor, for a foreign businessman. Still, there are about 22, 23 tiers hmm. uh, for license approvals and NOCs and this and that. This has to be streamlined. The countries which have succeeded in attracting uh, foreign hmm. investment, they have first, uh, first of all, they have laid down a business friendly environment. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another episode of the Pakistan Pivot. I'm Michelle Mohyuddin and my guest today is Ambassador Masood Khalid. He was the longest serving ambassador of Pakistan to China. He is a career diplomat and during his tenure, the CPEC was conceived, signed, launched and consolidated. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to start my podcast with uh, the fact that we know that China is one of the biggest powers in the world today. What exactly is the Chinese model of governance and why is it succeeding? Well, I think it will take me considerable time of the day to explain as to what the Chinese governance system is. Actually, uh, it revolves around one party, that is the Communist Party of China, and which has been uh, ruling China since 1949, when new China emerged on the world map. The administration, the government, statecraft, policy making, all revolves around the Communist Party of China. And Communist Party of China has, of course, has a structure, mm. uh, you know, which is headed by the president, who is also the general secretary of the Communist Party of China. So this is the highest position in Chinese political hierarchy. And then it has a support system. Uh, it is difficult to explain the Chinese governance system uh, and comparing it with the Western system mm. because it's a unique model. Uh, it's, it's different from other systems. For example, if you talk of the parliament of China, there are two uh, you know, uh, chambers. Mm. One is the National People's Congress and the other is the Chinese People's Political Consultative Congress. Now, these are the legislative bodies of China. And one has a 3,000 members and the other one also has about the same 2,000 or about 3,000. And these people are elected at the local level. And then they are elevated to these legislative bodies. Hmm. Parallel to this, party has a central committee. And above that, there is a Politburo. Hmm. And then top of that is the standing committee of the Politburo. So decision making is basically, you know, uh, being filtered yeah. or, or the information, I would say, to the government for decision making is filtering from the legislative bodies. It comes up and then for the decision making process, it rests with the central committee of the party. For example, the legislative bodies have made a recommendation on certain policy matter. Now it will come up to the central committee. Central committee will scrutinize the recommendation and then on the basis of their sort of, you know, analysis mm -hmm. and study, they will send it to Politburo of the party. Politburo is only 25 persons, uh, top people. And they again, they get together, they huddle, and then they see the recommendation. And once that recommendation is approved by them, they uh, send it to the standing committee mm. of uh, the party, which is only seven members, seven leaders of China. They approve the final uh, decision or policy. So, uh, and information because of the uh, because of the representatives who are in the legislative body the information is flowing from the grassroots also upwards because cpc is nationwide countrywide and the top departments who play a crucial role hmm. in policy making or planning they also have nationwide 
chapters nationwide uh, uh, branches so information is flowing upwards yeah then at different stages it is filtered uh, it is scrutinized and then after its crystallization it comes to the top body and top body decides china also has a cabinet hmm. which is headed by the premier and this is called the state council state council also deliberates mostly on the economic hmm. and management issues and they also make their recommendations so uh, it's in a way it's a uh, i would say a, for a, for an outsider it may be difficult to understand because yeah. it's little uh, you know uh, complex yes and one thing also i think i need to add here that the legislative bodies have their committees like we have our standing mm. committees in the mm. parliament like for example focusing on health agriculture mm. industry so from there from them also information is collected yeah. and then weaved into the policy recommendations so that's the strength there's a strength because it's a, a strong consultative process yes uh, there is an impression uh, you know that uh, i think china is because it's a single party state so whatever yeah, exactly. is decided by yeah. by number one there you know is <clears throat> absolute yes number one has the responsibility and the authority uh, to veto mm. or to overrule something but <clears throat> whatever policy recommendation comes it is based on uh, a strong uh, process of consultation and also the party strength of this governance system is that party tries to take this these decisions on the basis of consensus i i want to now come towards pakistan and china relationship what is the backbone of this relationship what are the convergences and divergences in pakistan's relationship with china well i think pakistan china relations um i would like to describe them you know there are clichés um and there are uh, lofty phrases higher than the himalayas than iron brotherhood you know high sounding yes. uh, higher than the mountains deep sweeter than, than deep honey yes. sweeter than honey uh, you know etc etc these are not hollow slogans they are not mere clichés yep there is substance and the substance is in the rich history of pakistan china relations now pakistan china relations did not start yesterday or they did not start with cpac they started in 1950 hmm. when both countries were new china had emerged as new china in 1949 yeah and pakistan you know was established in 1947 so at that point in time both were new countries yeah we started in 1950 when pakistan recognized china and diplomatic relations were established in 1951 that is from where the journey started our first meeting of the two prime ministers was in 1955 and the first visits of the two premiers prime minister soharwardi of pakistan and premier chon lai who remained uh, you know chinese premier till hmm. 1976 uh they took place in 1956 and from then on we started moving yeah first we started walking and then we started our marathon so uh it has a very rich history a lot of building blocks uh, most importantly uh you know 1963 uh the border demarcation treaty between pakistan and china mm. a good a great confidence building measure between pakistan and china because pakistan as you would recall was aligned uh, with the west at that point in time we were yeah. members of ceto and cento and china was a communist country you know hmm. two mm-hmm. different caps that way but we had struck a chord a a a point uh, where the leadership of both countries agreed and decided that it is in our mutual interest to promote our relations regardless of you know these uh, alliances and all that so we moved we have on. a very strategic relationship with them yeah so yeah. I, what i'm saying is yeah. that it evolved like yes. any other relationship yeah. 
but gradually we came to a point that full trust confidence in each other was built hmm. of course in 1965 war uh, when the united states had suspended pakistan's uh, military assistance and we were uh, you know engaged in a conflict with india in 1965 war and pakistan's uh, uh, military inventory was uh, based on us supplies and us had suspended um, the arms supply to pakistan china came forward and uh, you know uh, met that hmm. gap so i think that was a time we had already concluded the border treaty 1963 pakistan international airlines was the first foreign airline in 1964 to start flight operations to china because china was facing an air blockade china was cut off hmm. so these two steps then 65 war and then you know 66 or there about we started to uh, we thought of uh, you know connecting our two countries uh, and uh, through krakram highway hmm. so gradually one by one one by one one by one we built on yeah added uh, added uh, building blocks yeah brick by brick and that is how we developed trust so pakistan china relationship the central the 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 core of this relationship is based on mutual trust yep mutual respect and not just on the government level also it's a people to people yeah people yeah? to people but what i'm trying to explain is that pakistan and china have come this much in the last 70 years because we have tested each other yeah there have been uh, different crises mm. uh there have been occasions when we have faced pressure uh there have been domestic changes there have been external changes international environment has changed but both countries regardless of these changes have stood by each other yeah they have defended each other's you know interest hmm. and have never worked uh to to jeopardize Uh, the other party's interest so that is how we have built this trust hmm. and the edifice of this relationship is mutual trust mutual confidence mutual respect yeah. mutual interest and adherence to the principles of peaceful coexistence that means we do not interfere hmm. in the internal affairs of other i also want to talk to you about the chinese turnaround how did china manage to uplift millions of people out of poverty Uh, that is quite the feat and a miracle um can the third world countries can they replicate this i don't know whether we can replicate because every country has its own national conditions its own political systems its own political structures chinese system is different but sure we can uh, you know adopt their best practices in mm. various fields how china has done it is no uh, less than a miracle human miracle that what it took uh, some of the leading countries you know um, uh, nearly a century to transform themselves china did it in a matter of four decades 45 40 45 years and completely transformed when china started hmm. off their opening and reforms process 1978 79 their per capita income was 150 155 $1, $1, today it is 12000 $1, even pakistan was ahead Uh, of china at that time hmm. i think what is the key what is what what is the secret i the secret is first of all uh the vision of the party leadership hmm. china has had good leaders in succession who were committed to the national cause who were committed uh, to you know promote country's development so this is number 1 is the vision number 2 comes okay you have a vision but how do you implement that yeah. vision so the planning part so planning part comes and it's very difficult 1.4 billion people huge popul- biggest biggest population of the world huge country 31 provinces two autonomous regions hong kong macau mm. not a joke so how do you transform that 
So there comes the planning process. Yeah. Now for planning, good planning, effective planning, you need two or three things. You mm. need, first of all, clarity. What do you want mm. to do? Okay. Number two is planning along scientific lines, not on populist lines. Hmm? You are not pleasing the yeah. certain constituency. You think it is, in, for example, certain area is backward and you have to upgrade uh, or bring it at par with other regions hmm. and where it is lacking. So there <coughs> you get into scientific planning. Uh, you, you examine, you study the, the pros and cons in terms of the strength of that area and the weaknesses of that area. Yeah. And on the basis of that, on, the, on that basis, you do scientific planning. So planning has been scientific and uh, short term, medium term, long term. Now, the third element of planning is effective implementation. How do you ensure effective implementation unless you have a, a supervision or an oversight? So you have to have a strict supervision mm. and oversight. So that party ensured. Yeah. And the fourth thing, I think, because the success of China is due to its good planning and good implementation. So if there is no satisfactory implementation and execution of the national plans, then accountability. If your performance is good, you are rewarded. If your performance is not good, hmm. you are punished. So scientific planning, uh, first of all vision, scientific planning, oversight and monitoring yeah. and the accountability. These have been the key elements of China's planning process <coughs> which has made China into hmm. you know, a success. And then China also uh, followed the five-year plan process. Even now, there's a five-year plan. And each year, when the party meets for this national, uh, you know, their plenary, <clears throat> the prime minister presents the work report, how the performance was last year. And then what are the targets for next year? So one by one, one by one, one by one, they keep on achieving their national objectives through five-year plan and five-year plan if there are some distortions in the implementation or some uh, for example there have been some weaknesses in plans so that is done uh, you know through rectification and through course correction hmm. so this is how so planning process vision planning process and then the the quest to excel Yes, huh? yes. The quest to excel. Yeah. Mobilization of the whole nation. It's not that easy. For that, they involved party cadres to mix with people hmm. and mobilize them. <clears throat> and people were told, for example, villages, you know, your life will improve if you participate in this national endeavor, in this project. Gradually, villages were turned into, you know, towns and towns into cities and, you know, this process one by one, one by one. So now, whether we can replicate, I think some of the strengths of Chinese economy are in planning, agriculture, industry. Mm. Uh, we should uh, see uh, what are the lessons learned from Chinese thing and what are the best practices yeah. in these areas and where we can adopt them. And China has also, I think I should also uh, tell you it's very relevant. A big part in the planning process has been the contribution of the students uh, who were sent by Deng Xiaoping in early 80s to Western universities. Mm. Even now about half a million, if I'm not wrong, half a million Chinese students are in Western universities. So all these students, they were sent there for higher education to best universities of the world. Yeah. They came back and now they are at the decision making and policy making levels. So all their ministries, they are technocrats, mm. they are specialists in their field and they occupy these positions. And so they, I mean, they are playing a pivotal role in Chinese planning. 
it's very important so that cadre has come back mm. and they are fully equipped you know they have the best of education in china they have the best of education in in overseas and they are the ones who are steering this process what are the chinese targets what do the china wants to do china is now the second largest economy of the world by 2021 which was last year yeah they eliminated absolute poverty this was their first target yeah. they say that when the chinese communist party completes its 100 years which was last year we would have tackled absolute poverty in china and they succeeded okay by this planning planning process now their second <coughs> target is national target is by 2035 they are going to bring china as a relatively prosperous society and you know uh, middle income more than middle income mm. Mm. if 12000 is the per capita income now the target is maybe it will reach about 22000 or 25 or whatever <clears throat> so upgradation people standard of living is constantly improving and become a knowledge based economy high tech economy and by 2049 which will be the 100 years of china's yeah. new china china will emerge as the most modern prosperous country of the world uh, this is the national target yeah. and one by one they are trying to achieve it and uh, china has surprised the world they have done uh, they have achieved the first target yeah Uh, they are ahead of uh, the uh, timelines of sdgs now 2035 and 2049 hmm. so this is how the chinese society is moving uh, on a daily basis uh, there is a change in the people's lives their standard of living in poverty is a past thing hmm. uh, i'm not saying that poverty uh, pockets of poverty do not exist in yeah. china they do but it is not acute and the country and the state and the party has reached out to people in terms of uh, improving the infrastructure and in fact i can say that now china is truly a knowledge economy it is cashless society yeah you cannot pay cash there nobody accepts cash in any transaction it's all uh, you know through electronic means mm. so and uh, they are investing about 6% of their gdp on research and development and education so like you mentioned uh, it's a what, cash what are we spending by the way mm. i'd like to say here ji we are spending 0.24% of our gdp on research and development if you want to move ahead you said that what can we replicate you replicate what china has done in education science and technology and creating that culture where hard work and discipline is acknowledged recognized by the state and where you have a society you have a people who think that if china becomes number 1 country the most modern prosperous country by 2049 they will be proud they take pride in this national achievements so this is how china is moving so we have to understand that they have created this culture of hard work discipline national uh, rejuvenation and a renaissance hmm. uh, of uh, chinese culture and civilization yeah. china is the manufacturing hub of the world mm. their goods have a competitive advantage in the international market what are they doing uh, for their human resource what kind of training programs are they undertaking internally you mean yes. within china yes as i told you first thing is that they created this pool of experts and uh, you know educationists and uh, technical people who were trained abroad who went mm. for studies not yeah. only studying social sciences but studying uh, you know hard disciplines like um, science and mathematics and what not and they came back so they were sent in droves uh, mm. those people are now uh, part and parcel of chinese planning process yeah. internally for 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 the working class and the labor uh, they have uh, huge setups of vocational institutions and of course in pakistan we don't have this uh, facility at all i think we are lacking behind like anything 
so in the vocational training institutions especially in balochistan and gawadar the yeah, key yeah, areas where cpec is taking I mean, place why we we have yeah. somehow i mean we lost track basically mm. and uh, so they have trained their manpower and their manpower is good and these big companies of china you know they are huge humongous and they also have their own vocational institutes tactical institutes mm. where they, when they employ someone they are trained so training part is part and parcel of an employment process that way so that is why chinese mm. skills are good at all in all categories you know be they engineers be they draftsmen be they you know lo- lower category uh, technical people so they they have done that so i think that is very important and we should mm. also focus on upgrading our skill set of our manpower here mm. it's very that's a deficiency uh, deficiency in in our system big deficiency china appears to be on a path of conflict uh, with usa um so when the asia pacific strategy of the us is also hinting towards this what are the dynamics of this power competition and do you see it intensifying yes it's already intensified in fact um, in my opinion we are already uh, in in a sort of cold war or a quasi cold yeah. war between united states and china because united states has declared china to be a uh, competitor a strategic uh, rival or adversary yeah. for decades so this is a well defined policy yeah. of the united states now uh, china is seen as a competitor and this competition is in all domains yeah. be it security military economic business technology trade etc and you know different uh, measures have been taken by the, by the united states and uh, a new uh, you know partnerships alliances yeah. are being formed by the united states like for example quad and indo pacific strategy um and they have concluded foundational agreements with india india is mm. now you know a counterweight uh, against china counterweight to china here in south asia creating its own problems for pakistan so i think this is a well defined uh, uh, strategy of the united mm. states to contain china whether united states will be able to do it that's uh, a different question uh, whether they will succeed or not uh, we need a different debate separate debate mm. on that but i think it's a, it's a, it's a laid out strategy as far as mm. united states is concerned what are the expectations of china when it comes to navigating the us and china relations no china has been saying that us offensive strategy mm. to contain us is first of all not realistic not sustainable not durable and is against uh you know uh, the the interdependent nature of mm. chinese and american economy mm. and the world economy revolves around these two economies basically if you see mm. uh i mean 700 billion dollars worth of investment in china mm. by by american companies they are they are making profits iphone and this and that they they, they all manufacturing as you said you said manufacturing hub yes i've seen it personally how they are doing it hmm. uh, if it were uh, cheaper to make these iphones and laptops which we use uh, by uh, you know by apple they would have done it in america but obviously it is cheaper it's much more cost effective they are doing and so this is a very close uh, relationship economically hmm. so the chinese are saying that instead of managing our differences and disputes uh through uh, sort of negotiations compromise and conciliation america united states has raised the ante they have raised the ante by not only forging these military security alliances uh, against china by encir- encircling china mm. and by applying trade restrictions technology restrictions applying you know sanctions against chinese companies so this is not the way yeah. these are two big powers and the entire globe entire global economy entire global politics will be affected mm. uh if if uh, relations continue uh to to uh, you know become conflictual so i think chinese policy is uh, chinese would seek out americans and you know uh, biden yeah. and president xi jinping met recently for the first time uh this is a good move 
So one can hope that this process will sustain because I don't think it is in anyone's interest, of course not in the interest of the United States, not yeah. in the interest of China and the international community that both the biggest powers uh, you know, uh, entangle themselves in a, in, a, in a conflict. And how do you think that uh, Pakistan can, uh, can insulate its uh, relationship uh, with China from the adverse impact of the power competition between U.S. and China? No, uh, Pakistan has its own bilateral track in foreign policy as far as relations with the United States and China are concerned. I think we can, uh, you know, strike a right balance. Uh, we don't have animosity towards anyone. Uh, we want friendship with all countries, uh, antagonism towards none. Mm -hmm. So on, on the basis of that principle, we can continue. And the United States has been a partner, a valuable partner of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have seen ups and downs in our relationship. Uh, but I think we can have points of convergence where both the United States and Pakistan can engage uh, you know, in a fruitful relationship, in yeah. a productive relationship, uh, not having too high expectations from each mm. other. And at the same time, we, uh, we need to and we can continue to strengthen our uh, relationship mm. with China, which has stood its ground. It is time tested. CPAC is important for us, you know. So I think we can uh, follow that. And Pakistan is an important country in South Asia. Uh, no country, whether it's a superpower or medium power, can ignore Pakistan as far as South Asian equation is concerned. Mm. We are a big country, uh, population-wise, uh, you know, um, market-wise, uh, and we are in the center. Uh, we are a bridgehead uh, for at least for three regions. Mm. Uh, so we are important in the context of connectivity and Afghanistan. Yeah. And the, uh, and the overall uh, geo-strategic uh, picture of this region. Uh, so um, I think uh, Pakistan is important. Pakistan is, has a strong military. Pakistan mm. is a nuclear power, an emerging market, mm. a lot of potential. So I think that gives us a uh, good uh, you know, basis mm. to forge linkages with all countries, including the mm. United States, and I think if you see uh, the trend towards uh, regionalism now, all these landlocked countries of Central Asia, they are keen to reach out to Pakistan uh, for their trade access through our yeah. ports of Gwadar and you know Karachi. Afghanistan is landlocked. So Pakistan has great opportunity to, to work on geoeconomics, uh, increase and enhance its uh, internal strength uh, economy. And on the basis of uh, that forge, uh, you know, positive and productive linkages, economic and business mm. linkages with our neighbors in the West. Yeah. So I think uh, we can do it. Switching towards the Belt and Road Initiative, I mean, all this was being done, you were our top man in Beijing. So um, the Pakistani public was quite excited and we had a lot of high hopes. We really thought that this would be the upturn of the Pakistani economy, but then it did not end up happening. Um, why haven't we seen the kind of results that we were expecting? You see, our problem is that we sometimes have too high expectations from everything. And we do not somehow, sorry, uh, uh, don't think that is criticism, but I think it is important for us mm. to help self uh, you know, analysis and introspection. Yeah. We don't look at our own weaknesses weaknesses of our system, uh, weaknesses of our processes. Whatever has been achieved in the first phase of CPAC mm. is quite tangible. Yeah. If you would recall, seven years ago, six years ago, we had very bad energy problem. Now sitting here, you can see that we don't have that energy deficit, power deficit in our system. Our industry can work, our consumers can get electricity. How has that happened? It has happened because of CPAC, because the government of Pakistan uh, gave priority to the power sector and the Chinese came forward mm. and they invested when no one was investing in Pakistan, yes. no one because yes. of the serious security situation. They came forward, they brought in their money, capital, technology, investment, and they changed. So we can't say that CPAC has not delivered 
CPAC has delivered. Now, secondly, in the infrastructure and transport sector, we have done some, uh, you know, good projects. Uh, for example, this motorway project of uh, Multan Sakharway, uh, Sakhar Highway, motorway, 392 kilometers, state of the mm. art, mm. Uh, you know, patch uh, motorway has been completed and some other road projects, KKH and others, Orange Line in Lahore. So this has upgraded infrastructure. Mm. It has also created local jobs. About 135,000 uh, people have been given jobs because of these CPAC projects. Mm. Thar is a giving a change picture now. Even women there, you know, yeah. Thar was so isolated. They are driving there and doing involved in these power projects. So CPAC has delivered. Yes, you can say that the speed could have been better. I agree with you. The yeah. speed could have been better. But we had this problem of uh, uh, COVID pandemic, which slowed down, uh, you know, the process, the implementation mm. process. Then we had, uh, I would say, that the previous government also, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, give, did not give the type of attention and focus hmm. uh, which CPAC deserved. Uh, there was some sort of dilly-dallying. Uh, the, the, some important functionaries hmm. of that government also made uh, wrong noises yeah. about CPAC. And uh, notwithstanding... Uh, not cognizant of the fact that we are already facing a hostile India which is opposing mm. BRI and CPAC. We should have been conscious of the fact that if we delay uh, the project, mm. uh, who will benefit? So India and plus some other you know, important countries mm. are opposed to this project. So it is in our interest to uh, fast track this project. Mm. And implement. So I think uh, industrial uh, relocation of industries, Chinese industries, special economic zones. But we, we have not, not been able to establish the SECs like we, have we were been, supposed to. Absolutely. We have not been able to do much on that count. Now CPAC has entered into second phase where the scope of cooperation has been enlarged to include agriculture, IT, education, mm. health, science and technology. So I think this is, we should uh, look back. Hmm. Uh, where our fault is. If the slowness was there uh, in CPAC, which you referred to, uh, I would say that slowness occurred mostly because of us. Because when I was there, I'm a witness. Chinese companies, Chinese SMEs, medium-sized companies, state-owned enterprises, they were keen to come to Pakistan relocating their surplus industry. Mm. That would have created a lot of potential for our exports, joint ventures with Pakistani parties and technology transfer. That did not happen uh, because we uh, were lacking behind in establishing uh, you know, the infrastructure for mm. uh, special economic zones. Are getting a little bit more specific. Everyone is wondering what is the status on the ML1 project. It was a big project. What And what have been the setbacks? Well, I'm not in the government, so I can't really share some inside hmm. information. Uh, it is good that ML1 is now, you know, being relaunched. Um, there were issues because it's a very big project. It is now more than $10 billion worth and it's going to be implemented in phases. Again, uh, it was delayed. Mm, uh, such a huge project requires, you know, technical mm. uh, feasibility studies and financial. So I think both sides were not able to commence uh, the negotiations on mm. financing the project. But now I think that process is being mm. uh, restarted. And I hope because this is an important project for, for CPAC in terms of your connectivity, in terms of logistics, which you will need. If you want uh, the long-term completion of all the targets which you have set mm. under CPAC, uh, you would need, uh, you know, good communication mode. Mm. Uh, roads are also there. We are improving our roads, modernizing them mm. as far as possible. But railway is a cheaper option 
and it it carries heavy uh, you know freight mm. uh, look at the freight which is being conducted uh, freight traffic conducted between china and european cities under bri 10000 cargo trains go every year mm. between china and uh, european cities mm. because of a good network and you know our network railway network is very old dysfunctional uh, yeah, a lot needs to be done. Both for uh, yeah. cargo and, and passenger traffic. So under this ML1, I think our systems will be modernized. We will have trains, passenger trains running at least at 160 kilometers per hour. Modern signaling and mm. all that. So all the related paraphernalia. So I think it's an important project. And I hope it will take time. It, it can take seven, eight years or maybe mm. more. But Chinese speed, we, we have to somehow, <laughs> we cannot exactly perhaps match the Chinese speed, but we should try to you know, hmm. come at least near that speed so that we can complete these projects. Hmm. Because I must emphasize that CPAC is in Pakistan's interest. It is also in China's interest, but CPAC is... Look, whatever projects have uh, uh, taken place, they have taken place in Pakistan, not in China under CPAC. If you yeah. review seven or eight years, the projects have been launched in Pakistan, infrastructure, power, <clears throat> whatever, go other. Chinese capital has come here. Chinese technology, Chinese skill set, skill set has come to Pakistan. Right now, China is uh, not the one where projects are being established. Mm. Okay, connectivity is still weak. Uh, once the corridor becomes fully functional, when our KK becomes fully functional, then China will start reaping dividends. China is not yet fully connected uh, connected to Gawadar. Hmm. So it is in the works, this, this process. So we should keep in mind that CPAC has given, uh, you know, good dividends to Pakistan and will give good dividends to Pakistan in the future too. Hmm. So it is in our interest to, uh, you know, together with our Chinese friends, uh, sort of meet the targets. Yeah. So what would be the right balance of scale and infrastructure uh, that is needed for a country to develop and for CPAC to be a success? CPAC will be a success if we speed up, fast track the process. If we streamline our procedures, our processes and our procedures are still mm. uh, quite cumbersome for a foreign investor, for a foreign businessman. Still, there are about 22, 23 tiers mm. uh, for license approvals and NOCs and this and that. This has to be streamlined. The countries which have succeeded in attracting uh, foreign mm. investment, they have first, uh, first of all, they have laid down a business friendly environment i think we have to do that hmm. and we have we have we have we have made some progress but that progress is not sufficient to attract uh, you know uh, the business community uh, from abroad so i think that's a big gap if you want cpac to succeed if you want industrial hmm. industrialization of pakistan our exports look at the figure of exports it is at a standstill for many many years we can't afford, we, we, we don't have foreign exchange. How do we get foreign exchange if we don't have exports? Look at our trade deficit, look at our fiscal deficit. So uh, Our economy is in shambles yeah, so right now. Our so what economy do you... is weak. Hmm. So you, you have to, I mean, you have to have a new paradigm. Here is a partner, here is your friend, here is a trusted uh, you know, uh, friend who is prepared to help you under CPAC. So we should look at our weaknesses, that what is needed to be done on our part hmm. to speed up the process because it is in our interest. Industrialization is in our interest. Export-based economy is in our interest. Knowledge economy is in our interest. Modern agriculture is in our interest. And, and the sky is the limit what Pakistan can do. Arab countries are keen to have, uh, you know, agriculture demonstration projects in Pakistan. Hmm. They need food. China needs food. You can grow here. You can uh, you, you you have land. You have good manpower. What you need is capital and technology. Given the current state of our economy, what do you think is the future of CPEC? And what I would also uh, want to focus a little bit on Gawadar Port. What are the uh, facilities that Gawadar Port is offering that are different from other ports in the region? So your first question is about uh, the future of CPEC. Future of CPEC. Look, future of CPAC is uh, promising and 
provided both sides you know uh, remain committed uh, well on that count uh, i have uh, i mean no doubt we are committed china is committed and we are committed because both china and pakistan have uh, you know a stake in the success of cpac because cpac is a signature project of bri so china also wants uh, cpac to succeed pakistan for its own reasons also wants cpac to succeed so cpac will uh, go ahead uh, but we have to as i said earlier uh, we have to somehow streamline our processes now uh, gawadar uh, gawadar port uh, the work is again picking up now first of all look at the the idea of gawadar gawadar is a deep sea port uh, the idea is that we connect gawadar with kashgar in china and that gawadar become a transshipment port for the region okay for china's imports hmm. and for pakistan's exports and, china, and vice versa so uh, this is the concept and i think work uh, has been done now uh, ships are coming to gawadar port gawadar uh, the idea was that gawadar port will be developed and there is a smart master city plan for gawadar so smart city will be created in gawadar and what will be the facilities facilities will be like for example uh, for tourism uh, you know uh, uh, for for education uh, for health for industrial free zones where investors can mm. come and you know put up their factories and manufacturing units etc uh, etc et now gawadar faces two major problem one is the energy the other is water now chinese have put up a desalination plant and i think they are uh, you know further upgrading it to meet the immediate requirements of gawadar people now that is our responsibility that is not chinese responsibility to provide water and electricity to yes, of the people of gawadar yeah. okay uh, but they have done it electricity we are getting 100 megawatt i think from iran so there is a proposal to uh, put up a power plant also which 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 rem- which was delayed for good 3 4 years hmm? so uh, the idea is that we will have now a modern airport which will be completed hmm. uh, by next year entirely by chinese finances a grant chinese have already established i think a 50 bed hospital and it will be upgraded they have also established a vocational school for local people they have also established a school free zone is operational i think the first phase is operational and second phase work is going on then they have also introduced the airport international airport airport yes. yeah next yeah. year it's, it's uh, it will be completed power plant is a project i hope it's launched soon internet services we huh? we need internet services in huh. gawadar and then its connectivity with the rest of the world yeah. uh, with, sorry sorry with the rest of the country gawadar so i hope if we work uh you know sincerely and si- seriously on gawadar i think within the next 5 years uh, we will see gawadar port thriving and you know catering to because i know personally that from gawadar they have very good uh, you know seafood and fish quality mm. is very good and that fish call uh, fish and seafood is being exported to china mm. uh, so i think we can expand on that we can have uh, this uh, modern fishery plants so there's a lot of sc- and i think we need to leverage that mm. advantage which pakistan has and it's a very uh, key location for pakistan it's next to chabahar port we can have a sister city link uh, sister port uh, linkage uh, between gawadar and uh, chabahar and mm. I, i was looking at the news yesterday sri lanka is interested to link up uh, their their port of uh, colombo mm. with with gawadar so pakistan has great potential if really you know exploited to our advantage in the end i want to ask you about uh, your time in china anything mm-hmm. that you would like to share with us well first of all uh, on a concluding note i'll say that pakistan china relationship is uh, strong multifaceted broad based and it has great potential for expansion to the advantage of both countries and cpac is a window of opportunity for pakistan which uh, we need to uh, fully uh, utilize okay because that will really mm. uh, that will really 
upgrade Pakistan's status as a regional trade and energy hub. Hmm? So we should take advantage of our uh, geographic hmm. location. About my experience in China, well, it was, I have served in different countries and each country has its own peculiar culture and system and all that. Of course, China is different. But I tell you, honestly, both professionally and socially, personally, it was a great experience. Because it's a civilization, it's a culture, mm. they have rich history and the dynamism and the drive of the Chinese people and the Chinese society is amazing. I have served in Malaysia also, I have served in South Korea also, I have seen these Asian societies personally, how they have changed their fate, how they have changed their fortunes from... You see, it was a great experience because China uh, is a civilization. 5,000 years old civilization, which has maintained its continuity. Rich culture, you know, diversity, 56 yeah. ethnic groups in China. It's not something which is like a robot which is moving. Yeah, they, they, sometimes one gets the impression that the whole society is, how do they do it? Mm. Is it automatic, a very robotic, what? But 56 ethnic groups mm. yet living there, you know, happily or whatever. And then, the dynamism and the drive of the Chinese society, Chinese people and the Chinese uh, government is amazing. Uh, punctuality, discipline, dedication, commitment to the country, these are the hallmarks. Mm. And I traveled uh, quite a bit in China, loved their, uh, you know, food, mm. the different culture, cuisine, different cultural experiences. Uh, the way they have developed their infrastructure, uh, 40,000 kilometers plus of fast trains connect China, including Tibet, which is, you know, on the permafrost. Hmm. So when you see that development with your own eyes, get impressed. You feel inspired. You get yeah. impressed. Yeah. And you wish that the type of potential our people have and the talent we have, Pakistani people are very talented and they are acknowledged and recognized all over for their hard work, for their intelligence hmm. and uh, for their, you know, uh, creativity. Uh, so I think we need to create an enabling environment for them within Pakistan to, to show their true potential and learn from Wherever, wherever we can, actually, be it China or some other countries. And we should welcome uh, the foreign investors, uh, foreign businessmen, and create a conducive environment, mm -hmm. a business-friendly environment for them so that Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, meets its development deficit. Well, thank you for your time and thank you for clearing up a lot of things. I really appreciate that. And thank you for watching. If you found this discussion informative, do let us know about it in the feedback section and I'll see you next Saturday.